My name is Mark Lawrence, and next month I'll assume the role of director of the LBJ Presidential Library. I can't wait to get, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I can't wait to get started in that role, and it's a real treat tonight to jump the gun a little bit by taking part in tonight's festivities. Before I introduce our guest of honor, I'd like to recognize our friends programming sponsors, St. David's Healthcare and the Moody Foundation. Thank you so much for your generous support. <laughs> Upcoming Friends programs will feature former US Senator and NBA star Bill Bradley on February 11th, and Ford Foundation President Darren Walker on March 5th. Among the many great things about stepping into the directorship of this institution is the opportunity to continue a long tradition of bringing innovative, exciting, and culturally rich exhibitions to the Austin community. Tonight's event celebrates our current special exhibit, Motown, The Sound of Young America. Curated by the Grammy Museum, the exhibit is the first to embrace all facets, music, culture, and politics, of one of the most significant artistic and cultural departures of the 1960s. Motown, a blend of gospel, blues, and pop, began in Detroit in the early 60s and quickly became the sound of young America. Crashing the American pop charts and challenging the British invasion led by the Beatles. The visionary, Motown, um, the, the visionary of Motown, Barry Gordon Jr., a former prize fighter and songwriter, believed that talent could be found on nearly every Detroit street corner, and he succeeded in bringing the iconic sound into the mainstream. It's a sound that continues to influence music and culture around the world to this very day. One of Motown's top performers, the Supremes, remain the number one female recording group of all time, according to Billboard magazine. Tonight, we are enormously privileged to have as our special guest a founding member of the Supremes, Mary Wilson, who achieved an unprecedented 12 number one hits, including Where Did Our Love Go, Baby Love, Stop in the Name of Love, and Back in My Arms Again. The Supremes made history as the first African-American artists on The Ed Sullivan Show, and their successes helped change racial perceptions throughout the country. Mary went on to become a best-selling author, motivational speaker, businesswoman, and former US cultural ambassador. Her new book, Supreme Glamour, which some of you have seen, uh, documents not only the journey of the Supremes from their founding in Detroit in 1959 to their disco hits of the 1970s, but also their glamorous, coordinated clothing ensembles that became one of their signatures. As moderator this evening, we were scheduled to have LBJ Foundation CEO Mark Updegrove with us, but unfortunately, he came down with a bad case of laryngitis and extends his apologies. Uh, very happily, however, our good friend Ju Judy Maggio graciously agreed to do the honors. Judy Maggio, as many of you uh, will know, is a very prominent local journalist now serving as editorial director for the Austin PBS station KLRU. She leads Decibel, a multi-platform news initiative doing in-depth reporting on key community issues in Central Texas. Judy is a gifted journalist and we're really thrilled that she could join us. Thank you so much to Judy. After the program, please plan to join us for a holiday reception in the Great Hall upstairs. The Motown exhibit will be open, and you can pick up a copy of Mary's books and other holiday gifts in the store, as well as enjoying an amazing array of Motown-themed hors d'oeuvres. I'm very curious to see what that <laughs> involves. This fall, Universal Mu Music Group and Showtime released a feature-length documentary to mark the 60th anniversary of the founding of Motown Records. I invite you to watch a short clip now to set the stage for tonight's conversation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mary Wilson and Judy Maggio to the stage. She's coming. <laughs> If 
she doesn't make it, I'll just sing for y'all, okay? <laughs> Judy, Judy, Judy. Mary, Mary, Mary. Hi. I am so thrilled that Mark Octogrove oh. lost his voice. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I told him that I, I would make him a hot toddy, you know, to help that voice come, We've got come back. got a hot toddy okay. for you, Mark. But thank you for trusting me for sitting in this <laughs> beloved seat. And thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. Thank you, thank you. We are delighted to have you. And I know that you've just gotten done with all the dancing with the stars. I know. This is a whole new generation who's going to learn about you and your many, many talents, including your dancing ability. Well, you know, but I think that probably everyone here saw us on the Ed Sullivan shows and, and the Dean Martin show and the, yeah. and the Sonny and Cher show, Hullabaloo, Shindig, mm -hmm. and, we, and we always danced. Yeah. I mean, we always dance, so that's why I tell everyone this. It wasn't new for me to to dance because we always we had the best choreographer in the world, Charlie Atkins, who did the stop in the name of love. <laughs> yes. Before you break my heart, think it over. Um, but I, I, I was someone sent me a, a, a sort of videos, I guess. Uh, and, and I was able to see all of the different shows that we did. We, Florence, Diana, and I did on the Ed, Ed Sullivan Show and Shindig and Hullabaloo. And we were always doing, uh, you know, those standard dances. I mean, that's what we did. So uh, when I got on Dance with the Stars, even though it had been 50-some years <laughs> earlier, uh, it, wasn't, it, it, was, it was still wonderful to be able to do all those different dances. And as, most people know I was one of the first people to be eliminated from the show. We won't talk about that. No, we Robbed. won't talk. No, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> and, and the reason why I say that is that, you know, it, it's one of those things where people say, oh, I just love you, but people didn't vote, you know. <laughs> So you can love you can love someone, but you got to vote for who you want up yeah. there or in there, <laughs> right? So there you go. But I enjoyed it. I, I totally had a great time being on the show. I really did. I, I would have liked to have been on a little longer, but I made so many great uh, friends, uh, and and so you know now it's almost like the at Motown. A lot of us grew up together there, and whenever we're together, it's like, a, what you call it, a family reunion. So now sure. Dance with the Stars is like a family reunion. You have thing. a new I generation to, a to new have generation. a family reunion yes, with. Yes. Well, I want to go back to the very beginning okay. and, and talk about your start, because I don't think a lot mm -hmm. of people realize, didn't you guys start with four people and you were the primettes? We started with four, and uh, let me see, it was in 1959, um, and I think we were probably around 13 years old. Uh, in 1959, and so we started singing as four, like you said, four members, four girls. We were all from, we all lived in Detroit, Michigan, and what was really great about the time was I, when DJs, I don't know, nowadays you don't have radio like we used to have, you know, a DJ could make or break you, you know, and uh, I, I met a couple of ladies who said they were from American Bandstand in Philadelphia. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we were talking about, you know, these DJs who, uh, who used to, like, they would say, they would have dances on the weekend, and they would say, come on down to the Greystone Ballroom because we got Johnny Mathis, da-da-da-da-da, and the primates. Well, no one knew who we were because we didn't. <laughs> we didn't have any hit records back then. You but were we, babies but too. We were, we were babies. We were only by this time we were like 14 years old, and so we would do these record hops. And pretty soon we realized that uh, we were on the shows with people who were recording and making music. People we were hearing on the radio, and we said, "Whoa, whoa! We've just been doing this for as a hobby." Now, maybe we should think about recording. So that's kind of how we got into it. It was first a hobby, and then we got hooked into it. And, and so uh, what led you to, Mo to Motown? Motown? Yeah. It was pr probably the fact that we were, um, you know, just doing all these shows. These, 
disco shows. We were doing all those things. And so, uh, you know, being with people who were actually making music, we started, I always say we kind of dare to dream. And this was at a time, I'm going to get a little serious for right now. This was a, at a time when black people uh, didn't really, only thing, you know, people were daring to do was just to stay alive. Right, um, and my aunts and uncles they would talk about these times, and so for us when we started singing, you know, and and thinking about recording, this was another kind of dream that we had, and um, once once we were on a show, I think it was with uh, Johnny Mathis, we went back and we said, you know what, maybe we should think about uh, recording music, and and that's when we kind of dared to dream. It was an impossible dream. But we did it, and we got an audition with Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, who Diane knew it. Diane knew Smokey from another neighborhood. And uh, so she said, well, I know Smokey. Maybe we can go over there and get an audition, have his group you know, to uh, listen to us. And we did that. And um, that's how we kind of hooked up with Motown, because then after that, um, we got an audition with Mr. Barry Gordy. And that changed and everything. That changed. Not only did it change everything, it's who I am today. Is why I'm standing here today, because Mr. Barry Gordy did like us. And uh, he signed us. But at first, he didn't sign us. In fact, um, really? he, you know, at first, he said to us, he says, look, why don't you girls go back to high school and, and come back after you graduate from school? <laughs> So we didn't realize that at the time that he really was probably just a little leery of four girls, young teenage girls, we weren't even 16 yet, who uh, he didn't want to be responsible for. At the time, we just thought maybe he was just kind of, oh, they're not good, da, da, da. But we knew we were good. This is something about me, Florence, and Diane. We actually knew that we were really good. Uh, and and, and I said, when I first met Diane, Florence, and Betty, the fourth member, I realized that something, something was happening to me in life. It was almost like at the age of 13, I, I saw myself here in front of you. I saw something that I didn't even understand, but they kind of, they kind of actually completed me, let's put it that way. I saw parts in them that I didn't maybe have or know I had. And I felt with them it was a complete group. And I think that people around the world have felt that when they saw the Supremes, it was like one perfect unit. We really were one, you know, one perfect unit. Now, I think I read you're the number one female recording group. Well, <laughs> I won't get into the politics, but you know, it, it depends on different polls. You know, what polls? <laughs> Politics is like that too. That, well, that's what I was <laughs> implying. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so I mean, I, I, my favorite groups, well, back then, girl groups were really popular. The Chantels, the Shirelles, yeah. you know, the, the Lennon sisters. I mean, it was girl power was out there. Um, and then they kind of left. Um, and so now, some of the groups, I think, are much better than we are. But no you know, way. in terms of but in terms of record sales, the Supremes in 1964 had their first number one um, selling million selling record, and then we had five consecutive number one million selling records in from 1965, and then we had one that wasn't quite a number one, but then we, after that one we had another five, so we had like ten, ten and eleven number one million selling records, and we gave those those Beatles and Rolling Stones and all them <laughs> English boys <laughs> a run for their money, and we were girls. Uh, but there, I, I, was, I, I should say this, I was talking about the other girl groups. There were lots of girl groups, the Ronettes, you know, the, the Dixie Cups. I mean, we were all doing very well. But I think why the Supremes became, were, were voted the number one female group of all time was mainly because television came into play. And as we look now, it's the same thing. I mean, if you become a star on television, you are, you are a major star. Well, I remember working with all these great stars who never made as much money as some of these kids are making today, you know, on television, reality st stars and all that stuff. Back then, I mean, I used to hang out with Sammy Davis and, 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 and Bob Hope, I mean, all these people, and no one ever made the kind of money they're making today. Television does can do that for you. You can change your life. Back then, it was the same thing, because because prior to, what, 63, 
64. Uh, you know, television wasn't, it wasn't the same thing, but once the variety show started, you know, like I say, the Ed Sullivan, the, there were so many others, I can't even think of the name right now. But once that started, we, the Supremes, had our hit records, and we, we, we were on every major TV show. So we went into the homes of everyone. So I think that that made us probably not so much better than any other group. It was just that we had the exposure from television that the other artists did not have, the other people. So that's one of the reasons we were voted you know, the number one female group. Also, we were kind of known not just for the music. My book. <laughs> Judy, let me tell you. I'm doing my fashion. Anna White impersonation. I, see, right, right. <laughs> I know, I know. But the, uh, the fashion. We were known for the not just the music, it was also fashion because uh, our word, image was that of, of, of glamour. Yeah. And for three little black girls, you know, the, yeah. back in the 60s, that was something, it was unheard of, you know. Tell us about this book. Why, well, why the books? I know you've written two others in the past. What what's, makes this one special, And it, other than the fact that it's absolutely visually beautiful? Well, because of what I'm just saying now about the fashion. It's about... The, the glamour that kind of doesn't exist now, you know. Uh, I remember we bought our first uh, pearl necklaces at Woolworths. <laughs> and, and, and our first pictures were of us wearing these little pearls, you know, because in, that's we, glamour was it. So our, our image was, our image kind of, I, I won't say surpassed the records because probably most any everyone in here knows of all of our records. Stop in the name of love, baby love. You can't hear your love. You keep it hanging on. You know everyone knows about the music, but the image, the imagery that we had was also great. I'll give you a great story. My brother Roosevelt, who was in the Vietnam War, and uh, I, I do have to say that he, after he came back, he was not really. Uh, he was never the same. But uh, I remember one time he was stationed in uh, Santo Domingo, I think it was, and we were playing in, in uh, Miami at the Eden Rock or Doville Hotel, I'm not sure which one it was. And so he came over from Santo Domingo and, and, and we, were, we did our show, The Supremes, and afterwards this beautiful young lady came over, a Jewish lady, and she says, I'm so happy to meet you guys. She says, and you know, she says, I, I, I allow my children and my family to watch you when you're on every, every Sunday on Ed Sullivan's show. So my brother, who was a wannabe panther, <laughs> he never got that far. But anyway, so he was there. He says, what does she mean? She allows her family to stay up to watch you guys on the Ed Sullivan show. I'm like, well, Roosevelt, th that's what, what it is now. Because back in those days, people did not allow their children to, to watch black people. So we were one of the, we were one of the first to and television again was what really helped um, people to allow black people into their homes. And so that's kind of what it was all about. I know Oprah mentioned that seeing you <laughs> and the Supremes on the, on the Ed Sullivan show was the first time she yes, identified as a role model. Vanna, 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 oh no, I mean Judy. <laughs> yeah, that, you, that you really were a role model for, for young black Girls watching television, that there's someone that looks like me, and that's she's what, on TV. That's what uh, oh, um, um, she, um, Whoopi wrote the foreword for my book. Whoopi and, Goldberg did? Uh, yes, she did. And she said, the very first time I ever saw the Supremes, I remember thinking, can I ever look like them? I had a black and white television, and I remember seeing them on Ed Sullivan's stage so poised and elegant. They wore matching tousled dresses and fly shoes. Ah! Um, <laughs> shoes. And um, their faces beat and their hair up in a bouffant, except for Flo, who had a flip. <laughs> they were three of the most beautiful women I had ever seen. Little did I know until much later that the dresses and the shoes were salmon color. Who knew we could look so good in salmon? <laughs> and, and then they opened their mouths. I've been crying, ooh, ooh, cause I'm lonely for you. Uh, smiles have all turned to tears, but tears won't wash away the fears. 
with arms. Oh, okay. Anyway. We love it when you sing. I, 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 was kinda, I should have sang that when I was reading here. That's okay. With arms swaying like thin grass in a mild summer breeze, bodies moving in synchronization, these were brown women as they had never, ever been seen before on national television. The Supremes right there in front of me, three different shades of brown, gorgeous, stunning, and stylish, made my head explode. Only, only Whoopi could say something like that, right? <laughs> Every, everything about the Supremes, all those gowns, all those pantsuits, and all those capes, gloves, furs, the makeup, the eyelashes, the wigs, made me believe they were speaking to me. Yeah. I too could be well-spoken, tall, majestic, and an emissary of black folks who also came from the projects. Whatever they wore reflected the many looks of black folks including their hair, which was everything from an afro to a bob. And that did it for me. That's when I knew I was theirs for life. They were unapologetic and brave. Mm -hmm. I look back and I wonder if they had any idea that they taught me and a new generation the pride of being black. Diana, Mary, and Flo, my heroes. Whoopi. Isn't that oh, beautiful? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, I, I couldn't, you know, when I asked her if she would write the forward to the book, I couldn't, um, I, I could only hope that she would because I knew she was one of those little black girls who saw the Ed Sullivan show. And, 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 and back then we just, we were just doing what, using the gift that God gave us, you know what I mean? We weren't thinking that people were looking at us, we were just trying to be somebody ourselves, right? And uh, here, Years later, you know, I see that we, just by being ourselves and, and doing and looking the way we wanted to look, uh, it really influenced people. And you, so you never do know who you influence yeah. in life, you know. Do you feel like your music and a lot of the Motown music influenced the entire civil rights movement in a way? Um, well, I, I, I would say, I would say that the way I look at what the Motown music did, is to give people, and Mr. Barry Gordy said this, not me. Uh, he says, I want to give people music, the Motown sound, so that everybody can, can enjoy the music. Because all prior people. to that, all people, he says, prior to that, you know, people had to hide, and if they liked the music, they had to, have to hide, uh, you know, not let anyone know that they're listening to black music. Uh, you know, he says, I want people to be able to enjoy music, because as we know, throughout the ages, I mean, I went back to NYU and got my associate's degree in uh, 2000, I think I graduated in 2001, and I remember that it, it was wonderful to be able to get myself, well, I, I don't know how you can say it, so that I could feel like a star. I mean, we were, oh, sorry, we were, we were stars, but still inside we felt like little niggers. Oh. And until you get a certain kind of, of, of sort of enlightenment, you, I don't care how much money you get or how much fame you get, <laughs> inside you still feel like little Tommy or little you know, Mary or little whoever until you really can you know, be proud of yourself. So what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the influence the music had on the civil rights movement, because okay. we're going through another very tumultuous time right now, as you know. The, right. The music, I know, that's, that, I was going there and I went that way, but uh, the music is something throughout the ages, that's where I left off. Throughout the ages, we know that music has always been there uh, from empires from antiquity, you know, always been there to help people enjoy themselves. And they're kings and queens, you know, they have the minstrels and all this whatever, because music does have that influence. It, it, it gives a person, uh, you know, something inside. It touches you inside. It's not about your thoughts or not about anything. It's the emotions. Music touches the emotions, that's what it is. And so I think that with Motown, and Barry Gordy deciding to make that mu that Motown music, the mu Motown sound, so that it could be enjoyed by everyone was, uh, I have to give him the credit for 
saying that's what I want to do. Now, it's a collaboration in terms of all the people that came to Motown. Motown is like, a, to me, a Disneyland. I mean, the, the writers, the producers, all the artists, the Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, you know, I can, a whole list of Temptations, of Four Tops, and, and all these people, but it was a collaboration because we had a place to go. Mr. Barry Gordy was very uh, into knowing that we needed a place, our own place. So no one could tell you how to do your musical or what you got to do this, but you can come there. And that's what we all did as young kids. When we finally, when we finally uh, got the audition, oh, I'll tell you how I get, we got the audition. Once he told us to go back to high school, all right, Mr. Gordy? He did? Oh, he told us to go back to high school. He says, well, we, not that we were going to leave high school. Our parents would have killed us had we thought about it. <laughs> okay, because I mean, even though we were poor and we lived in the projects, we st our upbringing was extremely good. I mean, it was really, our parents were, my mother who couldn't read nor write, always said, I want my children to go to college. Uh, and so we were always, you know, we were made to, to be in school. And uh, so when we, just before we got our hit record, I remember I told Mr. Eddie Holland, Brian Holland, Eddie Holland, and Lamont Dozier were the ones who wrote all of our 10 million selling records in the 60s, right? They did the Where Did Our Love Go, Baby Love, Stop in the Name of Love, You Can't Hurry Love, I Hear a Symphony. I mean, they wrote them all and produced them all, right? And it was amazing because just before we got the hit record, I told Eddie Holland, I said, Eddie, we need a hit record because if we don't get a hit record, our parents are gonna make us, help make us go to college. <laughs> Shows you how silly I was, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was true. So eventually, when we finally got signed to, to Motown, I remember um, we were sitting out on the grass. I, I, must, I have a backtrack here to tell you how we actually got signed, too. I didn't tell you that. So um, we're still in high school now. We're in high school now. And uh, every time a, an artist say the miracles will come, we say, hey, Mary, how you now? <laughs> Mary Wells, ah, Mary Wells, Mary Wells. <laughs> Temptation, you know, so we, we, we ingratiated ourselves to Motown, so just by being there every day, right? So we knew everyone who went into Motown. And one day, uh, the, uh, some of the producers came out and they said, we need someone to do some hand clap for us, and we said, we'll do it. <laughs> so that's how we actually got in. You were just an audience? <laughs> Oh, we, we, you know how they say you sit outside of a building and you, yeah, we just sort of, we, yeah. Just hung out there? We just hung out there every day after school, right? So now we're inside and we're like recording, you know, doing bad hand claps and things like that. And pretty soon Mr. Barry Gordy said, you know what, you girls are real, I see you're very serious. He says, I'm going to sign you. And uh, now, by now we're 15 and a half years old. <laughs> That grizzled veterans by that time. Right, well, because we have been working all over Detroit yeah, doing the right. record house. Yeah. Uh, and so, so uh, anyway, so when the time came for him, he said to sign the contract for us, sign us up. Uh, he said, but you got to change your name. I don't like that name, Primax, at all. And we were like, what? Nobody's going to know us if we change our name, right? Uh, and so, no, but you got to change. So anyway, we said, okay. So all of our parents had to come because we were only now 16 years old. So 1961. And so <laughs> uh, we go there, and we th were thinking that he had forgotten that we had to change our names, but he had not. <laughs> and so there's a contract. Like Mike said, my mother couldn't read nor write. And so she didn't know what was on the contract. And we, all we wanted to do was just sign a Motown. Well, we didn't care. I would have given away my 11 grandchildren <laughs> had I ever thought I was going to have any. Well, now I wouldn't do that. But anyway. <laughs> but back then, we didn't have a lawyer, you know. And, and all we wanted to do was, so we didn't know. So we just, so we signed the contract. Our parents signed it. Little did we know that at the bottom it says, and any name you uh, acquire or get, will belong to Motown. So Florence was the one who came up with the name, and uh, the name then was Motown. But we didn't know this. I didn't know it until maybe uh, seven, eight years later, when Florence was no longer in the group. And then I found yeah. out that we did not own our name. Uh, and by then, we had, had all our hit records and everything like that. We never did get a lawyer. We never, ever got a lawyer to negotiate for us. And that was kind of. That's something I've been fighting 
for many years, but that's another whole, litigation is part of my thing now. <laughs> Well, I, I read about the you know, I, actually, I actually, I'm sorry, I actually said I should have married a lawyer, then I wouldn't have to, you know, I could get him to do all the work. Well, tell us then about this Truth in Music Act mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you've been sorry. fighting for. Uh, now, now, that's later. Now, that's, that is later. Right. Truth in Music, and I do want to, I do want to come back to that, uh, in that, because it is part of what, how I've become sort of a, uh, involved in, in, in politics in a way, you might see. But there are a couple of pieces of legislation that actually um, um, uh, Rick Perry signed one of them for me here. In, in really? Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, two pieces of legislation. One is called the Modernization Act, which has to do with uh, if you record it uh, pre-1972, Anytime people would stream music or play it on, do whatever they do on the radio, the artist did not get paid. If you hear, how many people out there think when you hear our music on the radio, you think we get paid, right? No, well, we don't. However, any artist from, uh, post 1972, they get paid. Every time their music is whatever, they get paid. So I and a lot of the other artists, uh, went on a grassroots situation and we got that bill passed and it passed in both house, it passed, everyone voted it, yes. So it was passed and Trump signed it, uh, I think, sorry, I keep So this it. is recent? This is more recent, mm -hmm. that's the one. Now the one that uh, Rick Perry helped me on here in Texas is called, which you just asked about, was the truth in music. And that has to do with artists who have lost their names because people are going out and calling, and they, they formed groups, and they called them by the famous names of groups that already exist. And so, you know, you can go to a show, and if you see a, a record that was recorded back in the 1950s, but the people up there look like they're only 12 or 13 years old, <laughs> you know that couldn't be them, you know. So the Truth of Music was passed, bill was passed, I think it was 28 states, and now I'm working with the RIAA to um, get that passed in the federal courts so that you know we don't have to use our own money. I mean, I've been, I've been in litigation and lost cases uh, because I didn't even own the name Supremes, which I still have been trying to do. So all of these things, are, those two bills are the things that I've been a part of, and I'm very happy. So if you go to a show and you want to hear the music, which I know people love the music, I do too, you know, but some of these people, uh, they've stolen our names. I mean, it's like identity yeah. theft, but it's music. So I want to get that into law, and that way we can, uh, you know, stop them. So that was that. I want to switch back a little bit to the Motown days. I was thinking about this because you all were African American and you were traveling. And after seeing the famous movie, I think it was the Green Book. Is that oh, the Green Book. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that and what it, what was it like for you as three African American women traveling all over mm -hmm. the country? Um, did you face issues or problems because of your race? Um, let's even go further than that, further okay. back, because um, for some of the earlier tours we did, um, we did Dick Clark, Caravan of Stars tour, and someone who just mentioned they were in, who said they were from Philadelphia, they were on American Bandstand, yes. She used to be there, she used to dance on American Bandstand. Really? Yeah. So, so anyway, we, we the Supremes were, before we became famous, no, let me back back a little bit more from that. Uh, because I was talking about Eddie Holland and how we wanted to have the hit record, and he, so I uh, told him if we don't get a hit record, our parents would send us to college. Well, we did get the hit record, all right? Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, Motown Records, Mr. Barry Gordy sent us out on a tour with Dick Clark. And it was a tour with Gene Pitney. How many people remember Gene Pitney? Yeah. Gene Pitney, it was, it was uh, the Shirelles, um, uh, it was all kind of people on this tour. I was black and white on the tour, and this still was, you know, early in in in, in that whole thing with, you know, black and white situation. So we would we traveled throughout the South, and in many places uh, we would pull into, and uh, they wouldn't let us all in. So I remember Mr. De Clark would say, "Well, if all of us can't come in, then you know," he said, "Everybody get back on the bus." So we'd have to get back on the bus. 
Now that was on the Dick Clark tour. And then now we had some Motown review tours, which was all black. And that was really tough on us. I remember uh, we got shot at, the bus got shot at a couple of times. And what was it? Well, I'll tell you what, a beautiful thing that happened. Uh, we would do some shows, and of course, they would have a line in, on the middle, and you have the blacks on this side, you have the whites on this side. And we go up there, and we're just singing, you know, everyone's singing, doing their thing, the miracles, whatever. And by the time the show is halfway you know, into whatever, everyone's mingling. And so we had this one, I remember this one, um, I don't know if he's a sergeant, what he was. Uh, I remember his name, Culpeck Pepper. And he would come up, he says, all right, all right, break it up, break it up, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing because we got on the bus and, and uh, then someone said they heard the gunshots. So Mary Wells, who was pretty popular at the time, you know, I've got two lovers and I'm not ashamed, remember that one? And uh, so she was kind of a little on the broad side. <laughs> and so it was an old bus, and she 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 just fell down the, down in the, the stairwell there and wouldn't move, right? So we we're all trying to climb over the contours, you know, the miracles, the temptations, what? the supremes, the marvelous. We all trying to climb over her. So anyway, so we get on, we get everyone eventually gets on the bus, and we take off down the road, uh, and then everyone started singing. We were, I don't know what we were singing, but we just started singing, singing, singing. And, uh, what a sound that must have been. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it was amazing because we then ran into Sergeant Car Culpepper, I think his name was, again, on someplace else down the line. He says, all right, I'm taking care of y'all now. Y'all just don't, don't be getting anybody aroused out here. You know, he was just one all in there. We were like, we're just singing. Okay, now one last story about this. And we love is, your stories. Tell as many okay. as you want. <laughs> and so this one time, the same tour, the Motown Review Tour, we... Um, Stevie, Stevie Wonder's record had just become a hit, I think it was Fingertips. And so we're in this raggedy bus, right? We're in, we're in Florida. Uh, I can't remember which part of Florida, but anyway. So we had a day off. So the bus pulled up to this motel and we got, we got in. And someone said, that's a swimming pool out there. And we said, what? And we said, oh, good. So everyone kind of came back down and jumped in the pool, right? And all the white people who were there, they jumped out. <gasps> So, no, so, so the, the, but the, here's the beautiful part about it. So, you know, we're like, oh, okay. Someone had a transistor. Remember that transistor radio? Sure. So, so someone had it, and the music was playing, and they were talking about the show that was coming to town with Stevie Wonder and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And someone said, I think that's Stevie Wonder right there. I think that. Oh. So then everyone jumped back in the pool. <laughs> and the rest of the day, we parted, all, everybody. We just parted. So it shows you. It shows you that you know what music does, but it what music can do. But it also shows you that when we're, when the law is a law, you know people abide by that. Uh, except maybe now, uh, you know, and uh, you know, but 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 we get beyond it because of our the human parts of us, our emotions. I'm saying that are touched with music, and I just think that I'm very happy. Um, that I have been in this business for 58 years, and that music has given me this. As we live through this, this tumultuous time that we're in right now, another divided mm -hmm. time, do you think that music can, can have a big influence like it did during your day? Do you think it's having an influence, a positive influence? I, you know, I, I, don't, I think now we're beyond that type of help. I think it's we have to go back to, to us as being human beings and what we as human beings want to happen. And everyone has to want peace and things of that nature in order for even music to be effective. I don't think music can be effective now because it's not about, it's not about that anymore. It's more about money, it's more about power, so it's about position. And so therefore, it's gonna, I think it's gonna take each of us to, to, to know what we should do as human beings at this time so that maybe our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren can have a better way of life. Uh, you know, and so I, 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 I think that with me, when I go on stage to sing, I, I, that's what I have in my heart. 
And so if that's what I can do, I think each person, mother, father, uncle, whoever, we, that's what we have to do to the world. We have to give the best parts of ourselves and maybe that can help change. And then of course the music can come in. But right now it's all about, it's, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to say politics, but it's all about, it's all this corporate type thing. You know, no one's, I mean, I look, I look at TV, I don't really look at TV anymore, but I have a couple things that I, I like. And I see that, you know, if you look at some of the commercials, you see things that I would, I would tell my children, don't, don't look at that, I mean, that's horrible. Um, and the children are talking back to their parents in commercials, or that, you know, it's like, it's like so negative. Everything is negative, and we're selling it. We're selling like, and we're celebrating it, you know? And I think that it's so bad. I don't really curse, and sometimes if I hit my knee or something, I will say a word or two. <laughs> and my, my, my children, if they hear this, Mom, what are you doing cursing? You know, because then I don't, that's not the way I brought them up, and that's not the way who I'm, I won't say I haven't done anything bad. I mean, in fact, I have a book that I cannot even write about some of the things <laughs> Is I that number four? No, no, no. Is that the fourth That's book? what they keep saying, but no, I will never write it. You know, because we all have, we all have things in our past and our lives that, you know, if you look back, it's like, oh, I sure was silly, stupid to do that. You know, I, should, I, don't, I, I won't do that again. You know, but I just feel that. It's really time, most of us, as I look out there, I'm 75 and a half years old, and when I look out there, I see people from the same generation that I grew up with, and I think that if we're so unhappy, maybe we should do something. Maybe we should do something. If we're gonna go away, maybe we should do something. You know? Or, I mean, everybody can't get up there and march and do all those things. Uh, my brother used to say to me, the one who was a wannabe panther, <laughs> but he was in Vietnam though. But you know, he used to say to me, Mary, why don't you, Diana Flo, wear afros? Well, this was when we were not, we were still like, you know, the big wigs the poofy, and the big yeah. guys, poofy and all that stuff. And I said, well, Roosevelt, you know, some people can march and make things happen, they can do this. I said, but we're doing what we do in the way that we can do it. We're showing beauty from the way that we can do it, and this is who we are. And, and I really feel that way. I think that each person should be honest with themselves and try to just do what you think should be done. What is that? Do unto others as you have others do unto you. Golden but, rule. But we've kind of lost a lot of that. I mean, you know, so I'm, I'm happy that I grew up in the time when I grew up with my grandparents and my mom and my aunts and my uncles telling me, you know, the right thing to do. Not that I always did it, but I mean, I do, do think that, yes. What do you think? Oh, I want to tell you one thing. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> go right ahead. I, I, because because we kind of stage is your we're, we're, we're kind of moving here. <laughs> but my, I want to say something about uh, people that influence you and the mentors that we've had. Because I think that everybody stands on somebody's shoulders, whether it's, even if it's just your parents. But uh, my English teacher, Mr. Boone said to me one day, he says, Ms. Wilson, I know that you, you sing with this little group, the primates. He said, but if you don't pass my, my class, you will not graduate, okay? You won't be able to go out there with this little group. Oh, that's what he talked. And you know, everyone has a teacher in school that you're afraid of. You know, there's always the one who's gonna fail you, you know, right? So you don't wanna be in his class or her class. But I got Mr. Boone's class every, his English class every semester from then. Freshy all the way to the last one. So anyway, uh, so I, I get scared because I'm in the 12th grade now, right? And uh, we're getting ready to have the, the, the records released and all this kind of stuff. So I wrote this paper. And it was a paper about my earlier upbringing when I found out that my mother, that I, my aunt and my uncle were not my mom and my dad. So I grew up thinking my aunt and my uncle were my oh. mom and dad, right? And so at the age of 10, I finally, they introduced me to my mother, and then I'm like, oh, wow. and then I, they introduced me to my brother and my sister, so I didn't know anything, right? And so I wrote this, I wrote about that, and how it, it, I felt like it had just adults are liars, you know, and, then, and it really got me. And so I wrote about it, and then I passed this paper in to Mr. Boone, uh, and he gave me an A plus 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 plus, <laughs> but 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 not before he gave me the old thing like Miss Wilson. 
He says, I think that you should perhaps consider becoming, and I'm saying, oh my God, all I want him to do is just pass me so I can go down and record. <laughs> he said, I think you should consider becoming a writer. Ah. I said to myself, this man is really out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as he passes me, it's okay with me. So anyway, when I went down to Motown, I, what the, the, I started keeping a diary because he, something must, I don't know, something got in there and I didn't think, I, I started keeping a diary at, at that age. And, uh, and here I am some years later, I've had three books and one was a bestseller. You never know, you know, when you hear something and people are your mentors and you don't even know they're your mentors, you know. So I, I really wanted to bring that up because I've not given him the predicate credit even in the book. I have not said that and I need to start saying that he is responsible for my becoming a writer. And I forgot why I said that. Um, <laughs> does he know about no, your past? He passed, but, but, but no, no, he does, I'm, you're right. He does know that We the Supremes uh, became famous and all that kind of stuff. In fact, uh, he said to me one year, he says, Ms. Wilson, I'm so proud that you didn't listen to me. So, <laughs> So that was really cool, you know, that was really cool. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, there are other people who, I, I've tried to mention some in this book and, I, and maybe in the next book I'll bring out, because when you get older, some things you, 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 you kind of forget people in a way. And there were many, many other people who really helped us, 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 us Supremes. Diane's mom was our chaperone. And she was just great. She was great for all of us. Um, we had people who would just drive us. I mean, we had so many people who were our, our who took care of us when we didn't have anything. And so when we became famous, you know, I I really have to now look back and say, wow, you know, there are people out there that you really got to say thank you, even if you can't remember them. You just got to say Thanksgiving just passed. Thank you for all the people in my lives because I wouldn't be who I am without all of those people who helped. That's the truth. Yeah. So why did you guys break up and what happened to the fourth primate? I mean, I know that Flo had mm -hmm. some alcohol and issues. People and say that Flo had the alcohol issues, but I'll, I'll go back to that too. Okay. Uh, and it was, she, she did, but not because of the alcohol. Okay. Florence was, I, I'm very happy about the Me Too movement nowadays Good. because when Florence was 14 years old, we were still the primates and uh, she was abused to, she was raped uh, mm -hmm. at the age of 14. And that to me totally destroyed her uh, in terms of her being, her full capabilities of being yeah. who she should have been. She was a beautiful person. And it was, that was at a time when people didn't talk about those things. You know, you, you just didn't talk about them. So her parents kind of didn't tell us what was happening. And Florence, Diane and I, I thought that Flo would get over it. Once we became famous, I just, oh, you know, this is gonna, she'll be okay. Yeah. But it's not true because she didn't get that help. And that's why this meet, Two movement that's out there now is so good. I don't think that people should go out there and say, well, you know, he did that, he did that, she did that. I, I, yeah, I don't believe in that, but some things need to be addressed, uh, not just by family or friends. Mm -hmm. They need to be, you know, addressed in a, in a way to help people uh, because those things really do destroy you inside. Yeah. I mean, I saw my friend who was a beautiful young lady. Florence actually named the Supreme. She's, it was, she started the group. She was a great singer. Flo was just, Flo, she don't know. The gun she loves is a Romeo. But that was in one of the records. But anyway, um, so, but she was a beautiful lady. And even when we became famous, um, you know, it, it, it was okay for a while, but pretty soon when other things started happening, she just couldn't handle it because it was, all of this was still happening to her. So when people say she was an alcoholic, I say no. That's that's not that's she not was the a problem. Victim. She was a victim, mm -hmm. and a lot of these people need to be helped. So mm -hmm. I'm very happy that people are speaking out uh, about it. Um, so what was that? But the but what happened to the fourth primate? No, that was it. Um, so for Betty, the original primate was a little older than Diane and Flo and I. She was, I think she was 17 when we met, and we were only 13. So she eventually got married, and uh, we had to get another girl, Barbara, whom I talk to all the time. 
Uh, and uh, she, she actually was a Supreme. So there were actually four Supremes, because oh, when we signed the contract, okay. it was Barbara was there as well. Very few people know that. I, I, I wrote about that in this book. And um, so she actually was really beautiful as well, but she fell in love. And uh, she got married as well. However, we did replace her because we said, you know what? We don't think we're gonna get married. Me, Flo, and Diane. We're and you gonna, sound good, just the three of you. Good. You sound so we, really good. So, yeah. so we said, so we didn't get a fourth member. So that's how we ended up with three okay. members. But I speak to Barbara all the time. Pet, Betty, unfortunately, passed away uh, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, I think it was. But uh, Barbara is still in love with the same guy. <laughs> so she said, girl, he said, she said, girl, Willie is... I say, well, yeah, but at least you still got somebody. We don't, we don't have anyone. To <laughs> so I love was it, yes. But the, why did you guys finally split the, the group? Um, several reasons. First of all, Florence was the first person who was put out of the group. And okay. Florence was put out of the group due to what you said, the, the drinking. Because she, had, in her own way, she had tried to, to you know, to, to what people do with people. You know, you got pain, you try to cover it up. So, um, and then her life just kind of, after having traveled all over the world, doing all these great things, and then coming home and not having the t kind of money she needed mm -hmm. and not all this pain. So her life was, she was one of the people in life, I say that uh, between she and, and Diane have, have really helped me to know what to do and what not to do. And that if you, you just got to keep going and believe in yourself and you, you can't let the pain stop you. A lot of things can stop you in life. A lot of things can stop you. And because Diane went Zoom to the top, I knew that that was there for me to do. Because Florence wasn't able, I knew that Mary, I was always in the middle. Middle child. <laughs> I was always in the middle. So I, I, I learned from, from, from them to um, you know, take care of myself and do the best I could to be who I really should be in life. And like I said, I've made a lot of mistakes, but you know, still, uh, in the long run, I believe that I've done what I should, mm -hmm. I, I, I right believe path. I'm okay, yeah. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we think you're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. I have one final question for you, though. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of twofold. You could be resting on your laurels at this point, you know. Ooh, but you're girl, out. those things stick. <laughs> <laughs> but you're out there performing. You're going to be performing at One World Theater here in Austin in February. You perform all over the country. You do dance with the stars. So you're home like what a couple days a week, and then you're off on the road. What do you still get out of that? I enjoy. I, I mean, I, like I said, I, when I met Flo, Diane, and Betty, I, I knew this. I knew that was. You know, that for me, I saw the full picture of, of beauty, of completeness. I mean, yes, uh, doesn't matter about the end or the goal. It was about, for me, and still is, for me, what makes me happy mm -hmm. as a human being. And so I, I, I tell a lot of kids when I, not kids, but children, when I, I do a lot of lectures, and I tell them, you know, you, all, no, everyone's not, rich and famous and all those kind of things, a lot of us have to work hard. So you might as well work hard as something you enjoy. And I've enjoyed this all my life. Mm. That's kind of what keeps me going, is enjoying it. Uh, I, you know, I say, are, you gonna, are you gonna retire? I'm like, well, then I'd be bored. You know, I love traveling. When I was a kid, a young girl, I used to read fairy tales. And uh, you know, for me, I, I dreamt about traveling all over the world, meeting wonderful people, falling in love. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, but you know, now I now I see that it's 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 so much more to life than trying to reach a goal because I think that we already are whole. I think that life is about maybe experiencing you as a whole. You know, and those each experience that you have, that's a picture that's already, I think it's already been done, you know? Um, and, and I want to continue doing it. So anyway, 
<laughs> so that's what, that was going to be my final thing. So, we'd like, love to. Uh, yeah. We'd love on? to hear your voice. <laughs> okay. I think it's on. Testing one, yes. two. It's on. It's on. Are you going to sing back around with me? No, just sure. <laughs> Uh, I can. I can. Oh, you can do that. You can. Okay, me too. I sang on Willie Nelson's bus with him once. Uh, did you? Yeah. But uh -uh. this is a much bigger thrill. Okay. <laughs> too much information, Judy. No, no, no. <laughs> now, now it's time for me to interview her. <laughs> there was a certain odor in the bus. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, I can tell you a story about that too. <laughs> The first time we met, uh, not no, it wasn't the first time we met the Beatles, it was the second time actually, uh, in New York City when they came over and they were staying at the, um, uh, I can't think of the name of the hotel right now, but anyway, we had, uh, the PR people had gotten us together and said, uh, we want to put the two groups together and, uh, you know, get pictures and do all those kind of things, so we got all dressed up in our little pearls and our little everything, we were like so cute, and uh, so we go up, we pull up and into their, the Warwick Hotel. Pull up to, uh, in front of the Warwick Hotel, and all the girls was, you know, standing out there screaming, screaming for the Beatles. They thought maybe one of the guys, so they ran over to the car, and they saw the three girls, and, ah, da, da, da. so they went back to the hotel. <laughs> anyway, so we get upstairs, and yeah, the odor was quite. <laughs> so they had, and in fact, I had heard that uh, Bob Dylan had just left. One of the, the Ronettes had been over. I mean, they were like, you know, they were like sitting up there like kings and kings, you know. And, Everyone was coming up to see them. And so, really, you know, they were nice enough, but uh, we, we, we felt that we, we told our guys, uh, I think we better leave. So years later, when, when George, George uh, Harrison and I became very dear friends, and he said to me, he says, yeah, Mary, he says, you know, we were wanting you girls to get out of there too, because you were killing our, you know, our fun. We were having too much fun. <laughs> and you guys, he said, so, you know, you three black girls, we thought you guys were going to be hip and all that kind of stuff, and you came up there, and you were so square, and we like, get them out of here. <laughs> so anyway. But you're here to tell the story. <laughs> right? No complaints, no regrets. I still believe in chasing dreams and placing bets. It's a, it's, a, it's a large chair. But I have learned that all you give is all you get. So give it all you got. I had my share, and I drank my fill, and even though I'm satisfied, I'm hungry still to see what's down another road beyond the hill and do it all again. So here's to life and every joy it brings. So here's to life, to dreamers and their dreams. Funny how the time just flies, how love can go from warm hellos to sad goodbyes. And leave you with the memories you've memorized to keep your winters warm. For there's no yes in yesterday, and who knows what tomorrow brings or takes away. As long as I'm still in the game, I'm gonna play for life, for love, for love. So here's to life, to dreamers and their dreams. May all your storms be weathered and all, all that's good. Get better, here's the life, here's the love, 
And here's to 